This, however, is going to be in English. Ich hatte keine Zeit, eine Übersetzung zu organisieren mm -hmm. oder zu verrichten. So, please buckle up. The movie we will be watching, Robert Bramkamp's Neue Natur, is a hybrid follow-up to his feature Art Girls. Part TV movie, part trailer, part supplemental elaboration of the meaning of Art Girls, part making of document, it is in all parts largely non-superimposable onto the feature. At least the story in the foreground of Neue Natur seems to revise the feature plot as much as it explains it. However, there is one point of emphasis in Neue Natur that does contribute immeasurably to the reception of the feature by folding the otherwise encapsulated irony out of the allegory basic to art girls, a reflection I will return to at the end of this introduction. Robert Bramkamp's Art Girls tells a story of heroism in the art world riding on the back of B-picture introjects. It is the allegory of all making as the making of a wish, making our second nature as daydreamers public, giving it a form, a forum for a change, an exchange, making it the onset for collective storytelling. In a span of, say, 50 years, contemporary art has supplemented abstraction with the B representations or fictions that mass culture won't let go. By the citation of B fiction in visual languages given over to abstraction, contemporary art could address the group psychological innovations that inhere in mass media culture. Art Girls revalorizes the interjection of B-films in contemporary artworks as the address rehearsal of a heroic alliance. The backstory reaches into German Romanticism with double brothers pulling the strings of mad science. The doubling motif sets the staging area for the first B-inserts, creature horror and science fiction. The art girls pick up the slack of doubling and guide the film to the next shelf in the bookstore, to fantasy. Fantasy is the B genre most readily dismissed in art and theory settings. But isn't the excess in beauty, feeling, and thought in fantasy fiction, which critics would stamp out as kitsch, another way of saying that it is most repressed? It is the proximity to its often disowned basis in daydream fantasy that comes under repression, even within the fantasy genre's understanding of itself. Tolkien chose fantasy over fairy tale, for example, to name the genre he derived from folklore and heroic epics belonging to the era of transition from paganism to Christianity. This choice dared name its synonym and significance, which Tolkien otherwise sought to circumvent through his turn to the gospel, the fantasy that is true, to subsume and surmount mere fantasy. The other world, the fantasy genre's ultimate address, redeems everyday fantasy, which otherwise carries out the circumvention, as Freud argued in Der Dichter und das Fantasieren, of the present tense and its ongoing tensions via a jump cut from an idealized past to a future of wish fulfillment. While Freud's temporal structure recalls the escapism we tend to decry in B culture, it also describes the staging area of the rescue through poetry of the omnipotence of thoughts and wishes from our private second nature as daydreamers. In Massenpsychologie und Ich-Analyse, Freud argued that the first poetry was the heroic epic and the first hero, in fact, the poet, certainly to the audience, because he had succeeded in giving daydream fantasy a publishable form, thus giving his audience public access to the all-important omnipotence hidden away with private daydreaming. According to Freud, the quick fix of wish fulfillment is the plain text of every daydream, 
what D.W. Winnicott refers to as the here and now fixity of any satisfaction that there can be in fantasying. In Art Girls, the psychiatrist takes the artist Nikita's reported manifestation of her striving for an effective art to be hallucination, symptomatic of her Wunschdenken. A thought that is, however, fulfilled in the course of the film, also in the psychiatrist's understanding and participation as, after all, Kunst die wirkt. Winnicott's suicidal patient is at the impasse of wish fantasy potentiated through dissociation. In the patient's history, nothing happens because in the dissociated state, so much is happening. Winnicott? In the fantasying, what happens, happens immediately, except that it does not happen at all. But Winnicott dislodges the dissociation by encouraging his patient to fantasize a version of her fantasy of cutting out and making a dress, one that would be more appropriate to a night dream. In this way, Winnicott is able to carry back a key word into the daydream. According to Winnicott, the password is formlessness, which is what the material is like before it is patterned and cut and shaped and put together. Winnicott continues, her childhood environment seemed unable to allow her to be formless, but must, as she felt it, pattern her and cut her out into shapes conceived by other people. This gives the first transferential revalorization of her fixation, which Winnicott goes on to describe. While the hope that would make her feel that something could be made out of the formlessness would then come from the confidence that she had in her analyst, who has to counteract all that she carries forward from her childhood, so easily she would have the feeling that she had fitted in and been patterned by the analyst, and this would be followed by maximal protest and a return to the fixity of fantasying. The doing nothing and withdrawal that fantasying carried forward amounted to the patient's omnipotent protest, nothing doing, no, not me. In his book, The Creative Unconscious, the only sustained psychoanalytic aesthetic theory grounded in Freud's understanding of wish fulfillment, Hans Sachs identified daydream fantasy as the evolutionary onset of a developmental process that yielded art. The focus on wish fulfillment, erotic, appetitive, but also aggressive and death wishing, renders the simple daydream not only inartistic, but even antisocial. One might expect, therefore, that fantasies close to the unconscious must be barred from art. But, Sachs points out, the opposite is true. The happy end stories and plays are entertainment, which means they lose their grip on the audience as soon as they are over. A new supply of them is constantly needed. The gulf between the tristesse on the center stage of high culture and the happy meal of daydream, as syndicated in low-budget entertainment, finds a liminal point of crossover in the exceptional yet typical class of daydreams dedicated to self-pity. In order to produce the pleasure of self-pity, these daydreams are willing and able, as Zach's uh, writes, to conjure up all sorts of misfortunes, poverty, humiliation, illness, and even death. These daydreams look as if self-torture were sufficiently attractive to become its own end. The painful input of the unconscious is to some degree evident in every expression or sharing of daydream fantasy that makes a memorable impression. Here, Zachs enters upon an intermediate form of daydreams, so-called mutual daydreams. The mutual daydream is intermediate, says Zachs, in the sense that it has ceased to be entirely antisocial without becoming art. And it is mutual only to the extent that its conception or dictation is transmitted. One party introduces it, while the other party recognizes it as his own and acts it out. It is a mutation in the relational aesthetics of daydreams evolution 
unto public broadcasting or art, one that Zucks would have needed to construct as missing link if there were not countless cases to cite. When children run away from home, for instance, they tend to do it a deux. Zucks constructs the mutual daydream as preamble to the missing linking in the evolutionary process of making a wish presentable. The first poets addressed an audience of partners in the mutual daydream. Improvising bards were the exponents of the emotion felt by all members of the audience. While it lasts, according to Zucks, the mutual daydream is guilt-free in contrast to every isolated daydream once revealed. The unconscious, as we know, is asocial. But out of the need of reacting to it, of handling it, of giving it a legitimate outlet, we see emerge here the formation of the smallest social unit, which Sachs calls a community of two. The mutual daydream belongs to the prehistory of both the group and the couple. That a missing link mediates this prehistory also means that it is as link clicked open on the turf and terms of evolution to mutation. In Art Girls, the uncanny duality of the twin mad scientists that backs the women artists and unleashes a power of art tantamount to all the hype of the art world gives way to rival couples as the brothers and the two women align separately over their responsibility for the wishes they make and realize. The new collectivity that Art Girls affirms at the end of the quest through B Pictures picks up momentum from the mutation within daydream wishing and gets around the showdown between the group and the couple, between mutual admiration and mourning. Otherwise, mourning is the prerogative of individuals or couples, and group commemoration is solely an activity of denial. Beginning with Prüfstand 7, Bramkamp has been bringing us ever closer to his goal, collective narration, which must be extended to mourning. It is the conceit of this film dedicated to the V2 rocket that the onset of the capacity for mourning, no longer up to individual development alone, its outcome hit or miss, is now fully upon the socius. We will indeed catch up with deferred individual mourning, only if the possibility of collective mourning can be reclaimed from the denial. According to fantasy traditions of the quest that are as age old as they are recent and recurring within the culture industry, the treasure that the hero brings back from his developmental journey enriches the community as well. In Art Girls, this treasure is the collective narration that already inheres in the efforts of the heroine and her inner circle, who, jumping the self-reflexivity of film to a new public domain imbued with the rescued omnipotence of the daydream, ultimately pro proclaim, wir sind wirklich ihr. One of the mad scientist twins, or doppelgänger, who introduced the mediatic innovations on an at once occult and science fictional basis, experiments on himself, which brings on the side effects that all the subsequent test subjects will undergo. As Wilfred Bion wrote at the close of World War II, technical developments have a way of repeating early situations. Thus, modern methods of travel repeat the problem and stimuli presented by first attempts to walk. Modern methods of communication repeat on a more complex level the problems of infant speech. Modern weapons of destruction have produced a repetition of problems of infantile destructiveness. In the case of the twin, however, it is a visit to an art exhibition that relieves his symptoms. The exhibition visited is in fact the Falkenberg collection in which the ill doppelgänger enjoys a close encounter with Susanna Weyrich's 2009 media installation, Angels in Chains. This encounter is more fully elaborated in Neue Natur, which further encourages reading art girls as the allegory of decades of cooperation between media artist Weyrich and filmmaker Bramkamp. As I advertised earlier on, this reading prompt 
invokes the aegis of irony in the sense elaborated by Paul de Mun in the rhetoric of temporality. Whatever collective narration may be, it is invoked literally. As de Mun pointed out, the literal is always the allegory of the literary. And the fictional props brought to bear in Art Girls take a running start in German Romanticism before making the jump cut to be pictures. Film is still a literary medium folding out of the invention of the printing press. Both media, literature, and film appear impervious to the so-called innovations of digital mediation. Visual media art, which is open to the call of the new, proceeds in the mode of testing, a mode Walter Benjamin ascribed to the film culture that occupied at the time the foreground of the new. Like Marshall McLuhan television, Benjamin mistook film as the catalyst of a new reception and integration. It is not so much that digital media are the new, but they inherit in their new archival capacity those stirrings of innovation in group psychology and technology that attended the traumatic history of the first total war and its second coming. Beyond again, writing in 1948, the same year in which Orwell wrote 1984. It is probably true to say that man is more skilled in the mechanics of handling anything from an airplane to a mass of his fellow men than he was 40 years ago. Following the release of Bramkamp's 2006 fil film Der Boot Gott vom Seesport Club, Weirich co-created with the filmmaker an accessory internet storytelling project reflecting a multiplicity of authors occupying at any given time 100 positions. Through, through Bramkamp and Weirich's cooperation titled Enki100.net, the guiding theme of collective narration could go beyond, as it were, the literary mode of projected utopia and engage instead in digital sampling, sorting, collecting, and testing. Already in 1995, at the start of the history of their cooperation, Weirich supplied in her serial work, All Work, No Play, a therapeutic conceptual staging area for the notion of the collective as ongoing collection. She introduced a so-called collective amusement park, Freizeitpark in German, which of course still refers to work or Arbeit by metonymy and absence. It was organized according to three categories, Erinnerungsarbeit, Trauerarbeit, and Beziehungsarbeit. Whatever the collective may signify ultimately, it was looped through the couple. Weirich's Beziehungsarbeit intervened from the start as the integration of the tension span that defines the relationship between the couple and the group within the projected collective carried forward by teamwork. Angels and Chains, which cites the title of an episode of the TV show Charlie's Angels, in which a serial killer is the object of containment, is a work of juxtaposition or collection which does not so much allegorize history as ironically test its staging areas. Benjamin argued that the collector and the allegorist inhere in each other while occupying its non-superimposable places, like irony and allegory, according to Demun. The iconic speech bubbles show reenactors of the Manson girls at the time of the trial, another three reenactors of their in the meantime aged personae, and the cited or summoned TV actresses playing Charlie's Angels. The Wagnerian Gesamtkunstwerk in Nutsche, Angels and Chains conjoins the juxtaposition and layering through the recurring melody and lyrics of Charles Manson's song, Never Say Never to Always. As primal leader, Manson outlawed the couple from his pack, the members of which were bound to follow his wishes as their command, as the expression of a love without Beziehungsarbeit. However, in Weirich's media reenactment, the primal pack cannot return intact and undisclosed, but only as disseminated through the multitasking of reference, association, and reading. De Mun writes, the act of irony, 
reveals the existence of a temporality that relates to its source only in terms of distance and difference and allows for no end, for no totality. Irony divides the flow of temporal experience into a past that is pure mystification and a future that remains harassed forever by a relapse within the inauthentic. It can know this inauthenticity but can never overcome it. It can only restate and repeat it on an increasingly conscious level, but it remains endlessly caught in the impossibility of making this knowledge applicable to the empirical world. Irony functions then as the negative to wish fantasy's private positive. It is up to art girls then to seal, uh, as de Munn writes of Stendhal's art of the novel, the ironic moments within the allegorical duration, largely through the slow time of meditative moments full of reverie, anticipation, and recollection. And with that, I ask for the screening to begin.